Now, Christmas is the biggest celebration of the year. Not only for us Christians, but for the whole world. Obviously, there are places in the world that don't recognize Christmas, and that's fine. There are still more of us that do recognize Christmas and actually celebrate this holiday. But Christmas is more than just a holiday or a reason for us to, to gather together as a family or even as a church because the main reason and purpose for having this celebration is that Jesus came 2,000 years ago to give us hope, something that this world needs badly, regardless of the generation, regardless of the culture, everybody needs hope. If you believe that, say amen. amen. And now, since we, as a church, come here together, not only to listen to His Word, but also to worship Him. And when you look back at the story of Christmas, you will find characters where you can learn something about worship. And sometimes you don't expect those lessons to come from those kinds of people. And today, we will learn a couple of things about worship from unexpected worshipers. So please be on your feet. We'll be reading from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. It's a rather lengthy passage, but it's a good story. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Christmas story. And we thank you that this story does not only involve the Jews, but also Gentiles like us. And today we will learn something about people whom we least expect to learn something about worship. And we ask your Holy Spirit to be with us and help us see the significance of this passage, not only for our Christian living, but in the way we we do life every day. So we thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Please take your seats. I want to call this message, Worship Lessons from the Magi. So in, in this passage, the writer of the book, Matthew, introduces the wise men from the East looking for the newborn king of the Jews. This is uh, one of the most popular passages in the Bible, especially come Christmas time. And today's sermon will be divided into two parts. There will be six verses each, beginning with verses 1 to 6. And I call this part, Seeking the Lord. All right, so 
We're going to begin with studying the background. What's happening here? Who are these people? That sort of thing. Now, Ma Matthew writes that these things took place during the reign of King Herod. You wouldn't believe what his name means. It means heroic. Now, this man became the king of the Israelite people after his father died. And now, he reigned in, in Jerusalem for 33 years. That's from 37 to 7 AD. I mean BC. 37 to 4 BC on behalf of Rome. Now, here's the thing. He's not a Jew. He is what you would call an Idumean. He does not belong to Abraham's descendants, and therefore, he was always looked down by people as someone illegitimate to be leading them. In the first 24 years of his leadership, he was able to do good things. He established peace all over the land. He beautified the temple, and he also gave jobs to the poor. At the same time, he completed major infrastructure projects. However, the last nine years of his reign were, were darkened by personal issues, as well as familial intrigues and clashes with Rome. And when you look at this man from a biblical standpoint, the New Testament portrays him as a dictator or a ruthless tyrant. Now let's talk about the Magi. Who are these folks? Were they kings? Were they three? Let's see. So historically, the Magi, meaning wise men, they came from the Parthian Empire. Parthian Empire. This is an empire that, that made up of modern-day Iraq and Iran, those two countries. So these were historically probably Persians and Medians. Now, they were likely astrologers and, and royal attendants. Now, in this account, we can see that they are depicted as foreign representatives, diplomats, you could say that. And despite the traditional belief that there were three of them, some people even gave them names. I don't see that in this account or nowhere in, in, in history. His history. We don't see that. And neither does Matthew say that they were kings. So I'm not going to jump to conclusions that they were, there were three of them and that they were kings. And given the dangers of travel in the first century, it is highly likely that these men were part of a larger group. Now, these wise men were looking for the one whom they call the king of the Jews. This was, this was a, a bit of a topic during our Sunday school lesson last week. So, I kept my words. I, I waited, so I'm going to give some answers today. I'm sorry for those folks who were with me last week. Anyway, so according to historians, Suetonius and uh, Josephus, they were, they were, there was a common belief among, among the people in the East that a time was coming when men from Judea, basically Israel, would make themselves masters of things. So with that in mind, we cannot also, we cannot discount the possibility that they had access to the Old Testament because during the time of Daniel, Daniel had access to the Old Testament and those books were somehow given or they were the Babylonians or the Chaldeans, they had access to those books as well. So both things would be possible. Now the Magi probably thought that this child would be, would be somehow related to that person that people thought to be the leader of the nation of Israel. And another part of this story is that somehow these men were guided by a star. A star. A star in the east 
and they traveled to Israel through the guidance of that star. Now, the purpose of their, of their visit was to worship. Now, what does that word mean from a first century perspective? From their standpoint, it meant, especially for Persians, it meant falling upon the knees and touching the ground with their forehead as an expression of profound reverence. And that kind of worship was often given to kings. Now, the news about the king of the Jews being born in Israel terrified Herod. Like what I mentioned earlier, people looked at him as someone illegitimate. Someone who did not deserve to be there. So he, he saw this child as a potential threat to his reign. And because of his violent tendencies, the people of Jerusalem were scared of what he might do. And this, this feeling, this fear would be justified when, when Herod slaughters boys aged two and below, found in verse 16. So what happened next? Herod called the religious leaders of Israel to find out where the Christ was to be born. So, religious leaders and scribes, those two terms are found in, in the passage. Who are they? Who were they? The chief priests served as Herod's cabinet and advisors, while the scribes were experts in the interpretation of the law of Moses. Now, in the Old Testament, the scribes were also often served. They also served as military commanders, friends of the king, and sometimes treasurers and messengers. And because they were highly skilled in interpreting the Old Testament, they were often considered to be people given the position of a judge. So these were highly educated men, and they knew what they were doing. Now, so they searched and searched, and they, and they concluded that this child would be the fulfillment of what the Bible says in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, and 2 Samuel verse 5, chapter 5, verse 2. And this is going to be the coming of the Messiah, who is portrayed as the shepherd of God's people. So that's the historical part. Now, how does this thing relate to our time? Here's our first point for this morning. True worshipers are relentless seekers of God. Obviously, there's a lot of things that we can learn from this passage. But I want to focus on one. The seeking hearts of the Magi. And here's what the Bible says. Isaiah 55, 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. When you learn about the historical aspect of this story, you will see that the Magi had to overcome several obstacles. First and foremost, they were not Jews. They were Gentiles, and therefore, they were despised by the Jews. And second, they knew about, about Herod. He was a violent man. He killed many people, including his own wife and his own mother. And at the same time, travel back then was, was dangerous. I remember Paul, in, in the book of Acts, where, where he, was, he, was, uh, he was about to, to be moved from one garrison to another, and the Roman government had to give him 400 soldiers just to protect him. So travel back then was not easy, not to mention there was no Google Maps. It was really challenging. So when you, when you consider those things that they had to overcome, you will see that these people, they didn't, they didn't allow themselves to be, to be threatened by, by racial prejudice, geographical challenges, as well as possible threats on their lives. They were eager. They were determined 
to see this child who was born to be the king of the Jews. And here's the thing. They may have known very little about the Lord Jesus, but that little thing was enough for them to set out on a journey and seek the Lord of Lords and the Kings of Kings. It was just a star that guided them to the very place where Jesus was. Now, in, in, the, same, in the same manner, the Bible commands us to seek the Lord while there is time. You know what? We live in this side, on this side of eternity where God's grace is abundant. We have a lot that they didn't have. But we have the same mandate to seek the Lord while He can be found. Our time is not unlimited. You don't know whether or not we're still alive tomorrow. No one knows that for sure. Therefore, we must have that sense of urgency in seeking the Lord. And I must say this, nothing is more important than knowing our Creator who promises that if we seek Him with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, we will find Him just like the Magi did. So, if God searches our hearts today, Will he find us searching him, or are we searching for other things? Verses 7 to 12, rejoicing in the Lord. Back to the story. So, the scribes and, and the religious leaders did their homework, and after finding out the biblical matters concerning this, this newborn king, Herod sets up a private meeting with the Magi to determine the exact time the star appeared to them. Why? Because he already had a plan. This boy is going to be a threat to me, so I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that this does not take place. And this will be justified when you read further in, chapter, in, in verse 16. He will kill every boy age 2 and below. When you think of it, if you're a, a diplomat and you're, and you're thinking about somebody being born the king of a country, where would you go? Would you go to a manger? Would you go to a cave? Would you go to Bethlehem? I don't think so. You would go to the very seat of power, Jerusalem. So this, these people, th these wise men, they thought that this newborn king of the Jews was somehow related to Herod might be one of his sons. Obviously not. Now, here's what's, here's what's interesting about this, this guy, Herod. They were sent to Bethlehem by Herod, and, and this guy, Herod, claimed to have the same desire, and that is to worship the newborn king. As we all know, this is nothing but a cover-up for his real purpose. He wanted to kill the child. So the king ordered the, the Magi to report back to him once they had found the child. So the wise men set out. They left, and again, the star appeared. As you can see that, um, the text implies that the star was not always there. It was somehow showing when they needed some sort of confirmation. It wasn't there all the time. It wasn't blinking all the time. It wasn't there. But whenever they saw it, they concluded that that was, con that was some sort of a confirmation that they were on the right, that they were in the right direction. They, that star served like a compass to the wise man. And when they saw the star... They were overjoyed. Remember, these were astrologers. These were experts in stars. They studied the stars. So they knew it. When, when the star showed up again, they were so happy. They were overjoyed because they knew that they were doing the right thing and they are headed to the right direction. So all of the stress that they went through with Herod was gone when they saw that star. 
And as soon as they set out, the star led them. Long story short, they reached the very place where Jesus and his parents were. So what did they do? The moment that they saw Jesus, they fell on their knees and worshipped him. And worshipped him. Think about that for a moment. They traveled probably weeks or months. And they had to deal with, with Herod. All they had with us was a star. And when they finally reached their destination, they were overjoyed. They worshipped the boy. I don't know about you, but when we, when we go on a trip, a long drive, each kilometer, each mile that you get closer, that it gets closer, I don't know, the emotions begin going up. Especially when you see, when you can see your destination. Like a few months ago when we went to, to Banff, when we saw the mountains, we were like, oh. <laughs> it was well worth it. The car breakdown, the long drive, the aching feet and back, the eyes, the red eyes, it was all worth it. And you see, the, that's just the mountains. <laughs> and these folks, they saw the one who made those mountains. And they were guided by a single star. But not only did they show their physical demonstration of worship, they also came bearing gifts. And not just gifts. According to Matthew, the wise men brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And you would find people saying, oh, those things, they, they, they carried spiritual meaning. There's some spiritual meaning to those gifts. Unfortunately, Matthew doesn't say so. So I don't want to go that far. Rather, I want to go to the practical aspect of it. Gold was, as we all know, it has always been and always will be a form of currency. It, it is valuable. And I think that the gold was used by Joseph to fund his family's migration to Egypt, where they would stay for several years. Without that gold, I, I don't know whether or not they'd be able to enter Egypt, let alone stay there for several years. Meanwhile, the other two items, frankincense and myrrh, they were also valuable, and they were often carried in caravans. Frankincense was an aromatic item used in sacrificial offerings during worship services, and the other one, the myrrh, myrrh was used as a perfume. I don't know what they needed that for. Matthew doesn't say, so I'm not going to I'm not going to speculate. Let's let's leave it right there. Verse 12 shows God's divine intervention to protect the Magi. So he spoke to the wise men in some way that Matthew does not disclose. But somehow he revealed Herod's dubious murderous scheme. So he, he directed them to go to their home country in another way. There you go. Last point for today. True worshipers rejoice in the presence of the Lord. In this passage, we can see four different kinds of people and their different responses to the news about Christmas. We have, we have the religious leaders, we have the Jews, we have Herod, and we have the Magi. Four different groups of people, four different responses. The religious leaders didn't care. They did their homework, they researched, found out, oh yeah, He's going to be born in Judea, somewhere there. But that's it. They didn't care much. The Jews were scared of what Herod might do. Instead of celebrating the, born, the birth of their, of their king, they allowed their hearts to be crippled by fear. And Herod, he faked his desire to worship, but he actually wanted to kill the child. And lastly, the Magi, the least expected of all to worship God. They were the ones who were filled first at the sight of the star. I can't get that out of my head. It's just a star. 
And when they saw Jesus, they gave him the best kind of worship they knew that was appropriate for a king. And when you compare things that have been revealed to them and to us, they knew very little about the Lord Jesus. Again, it was just a star, but they continued, they were relentless. They did not give up. And they were fine even when their lives were put at risk. They were okay with that. No one could stop them, not even the fearsome king of Jerusalem. They were excited to see Jesus and their, and their excitement overflowed when they finally saw him and his mother. As a matter of fact, they didn't come empty-handed. They gave valuable gifts. They came prepared to give Jesus what they thought he deserved. And my prayer is that we, in this place this morning, may our hearts overflow with joy as we think about Christmas, as we think about Jesus, as we think about that cross. Isaiah 61, 10. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. Why should we celebrate Christmas? Because of those things. Because of the things that Christ gives us. Paul says that Christ's righteousness has been imputed to us, meaning it was credited to our account. Prior to that, our, our savings, our righteousness savings was, was zero. Nothing. But then Jesus gave us His righteousness. So now, when God sees us, when He looks at us, He sees His Son's righteousness in us. Isn't that an amazing gift? God has revealed himself completely in Christ Jesus. 2,000 years ago, people saw him. People lived with him, heard him preach, saw him perform miracles, signs, and wonders. And they wrote those things in what we call the Bible. We have access to the Gospels and everything else, and we know that these things are true. Furthermore, we have the Holy Spirit who descended on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And He is the one who reminds us of the very words of the Lord Jesus. In other words, we have inexhaustible resources to knowing our God. We don't have any excuses. So we cannot face God one day on judgment day and tell Him, no, we didn't hear about your son. You can't say that. It is your first and foremost responsibility to know your creator. And Christmas is God's message to you. This is me who came to the very earth I created 2,000 years ago to reach out to sinful mankind and give them hope. So Christmas is a message of hope. It is a message of peace, reconciling sinful men to a holy God. It is a message of joy, a reason for us to celebrate because of that righteousness that God gave us through Christ Jesus. And we cannot forget the fourth theme of the Advent, love. All of this is because God loves you and me. But maybe, maybe if there's one question that, that's worth asking ourselves is this. What is in me that made me worthy to receive God's love? Wow. 
I've been trying to find answers to that question. For 15 years, I still haven't found one. I don't have anything to offer. Unlike those magi, they gave what they could, they did what they could, and God was pleased. So this is the worship of those wise men challenge you in a way to somehow level up your worship. Does the message of Christmas somehow refine your view of Christ? And what will you give Jesus tomorrow? Let's pray.